Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kim Coble. I'm the executive director for the Maryland League of Conservation Voters, and I'm really happy to have you join us for what's going to be a great conversation about conservation financing. It's not a topic that uh, it often gets exposure in the environmental arena, and yet it's really a critical conversation. Um, we're joined today by two people that are experts in this field, one from the private sector and one from, I guess, the nonprofit sector. And I will be introducing them uh, in more detail shortly, but uh, let me first express my gratitude to both of them for joining us today. Um, there is a bill in the Maryland General Assembly called the Conservation Finance Act, and it has been heard in the House and the Senate, and <clears throat> the uh, Tim and Jeff and I have been at the hearings and testified on these bills, and it's uh, one of the more interesting pieces of legislation I've worked on. It's complicated and complex in many ways. And yet what it is driving towards is very simple. And that is to get environmental outcomes achieved more quickly by engaging the private sector in the financing of it. I'm, I'm boiling down a long bill to a few sentences, but it, it's very uh, creative thinking and it's on its second year. So we think it's an important conversation for this group and for us to be involved in. So we're going to learn a little bit about the bill and a little bit more about the private sector and how what role that is playing in environmental cleanup. So uh, with that introduction, I'd like to introduce Jeff Echo, who's chairman and CEO of Hannon Armstrong, a leading investor in climate solutions. Under his leadership, the firm has become globally recognized for its pioneering approach to sustainable investing. Serving as a trusted capital provider to leading companies in renewable energy, energy efficiency, and other sustainable infrastructure markets. We're also joined by Tim Mayo. Tim is the executive director and founder of Environmental Policy Innovation Center. Tim and his company work to build policies that deliver spectacular improvements in the speed of environmental progress. Prior to launching his startup, he was uh, associate director at the White House Council of Environmental Quality. He worked at Defenders of Wildlife. He was a director at uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and he was a co-director at the Environmental Defense Fund. So we have definitely experts joining us today. So the Comprehensive Finance Act, I'm going to give you the bill numbers in case you're um, a policy wonk. Senate Bill 343, I think that's 348. Yes, okay, Senate Bill 348 and House Bill 653. The, as I said, these have been introduced. And the state has a long history of applying state funds for environmental improvements. The Bay Restoration Fund was created and that goes to uh, point source and non-point source, wastewater treatment plant improvements. They created the Atlantic and Chesapeake Bay Trust Fund that helps local government make improvements. There's cost share programs that go to agriculture. So there are, there's long history of the state funding environmental outcomes. As I said, what's different about these, this particular bill is it's an engagement for the private sector to um, come in and secure more and faster environmental progress. It expands the opportunities for state agencies to obtain private investments, and it alters um, some existing policies to facilitate that. So I'm gonna turn to Tim first and um, ask you to give a quick overview in your using, using your words on what this bill is set to accomplish. Thanks so much, Kim. And let me describe three things. It's a long bill, as you know, noted, so it's hard to, to be really succinct about it. But the first thing the bill does is it, in a number of ways, defines nature and green infrastructure as equivalent to gray infrastructure. Things like ponds and wetlands and streams, um, we all know, provide enormous services to us, can treat you know, water quality and, and store carbon. And the bill gives equal recognition to those. Um, second, I'll just describe like one of the ways it does that. One of the biggest programs that exists across the country is called the Revolving Water Loan Program. Maryland has two of them. 
one of them directed at clean water. The bill makes about a half a dozen changes that make it easier for that program or just clearer that that program can finance things like forest preservation, forest management, uh, wetland restoration, et cetera. So um, those, are, those are two parts of it. Another major part that affects five different state agencies, Department of Transportation, Department of Agriculture, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, you know, primarily among them, uh, is it creates a new sort of a contracting authority uh, within state procurement code it says the state, as opposed to paying up front or paying for services and activities like somebody sitting on the back of a bulldozer doing something um, or building a sidewalk, uh, that they can pay for the completed results of a project. The carbon stored, the nitrogen and phosphorus removed from, from, uh, from impaired waters um, or wildlife habitat. And so the bill creates this contracting authority, gives the agencies the ability to, uh, to use that contracting authority and those contracts really tie to private investment because what that means is someone's not gonna get paid until they succeed. And so someone else needs to pay for it, not the state, not the county, but someone else has to, has to put up the money uh, to get the work done. And it just delivers enormous efficiencies uh, in terms of, of the work and the cost for the work and also the innovation of the work. So I'll stop there, Ken. Yeah, and I, to emphasize that point there, during the house hearing that was earlier this week, there was questions about um, who absorbs the risk if the projects don't work? And can you describe a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, under traditional um, forms of contracting, the public um, absorbs the risk. So a project fails, you've already paid for it, you're already obligated to pay it, you pay it. When there's a cost overrun, public's on the hook for that too. These are, these are fixed price contracts for delivery. So if the project fails or it costs more than uh, it was supposed to cost, um, that's not the public's problem which is a huge benefit um, uh, and, and a pretty, I would think, enticing way to contract for environmental improvements. What about uh, the viability on this bill or the opponent? So what's your prediction on this? Yeah, I mean, the, the bill has, the, the governor has identified it as one of his top three or four priorities for the Bay this year. It has the support of state cabinet agencies. Its sponsors are all Democrats in both the Senate and the House so far, um, as far as I know. Uh, and so I think it has a really good chance of pack, passage. It passed unanimously in the Senate last year, just ran out of time in the House. The House created a working group that, that tweaked and adjusted the bill, made it even better over the summer. So the House members, the House committees are very familiar with the text of the bill. Great. And the opponents, there really aren't any, but, it, but like some of the letters, uh, as you all know, um, it, it can take just a seemingly simple proposal for an amendment to derail a bill, given the, the tight timeline that the Maryland legislature is on. Right. Um, so, for example, there's, you know, there's some pushback from the, the wastewater utilities about the green infrastructure that I mentioned and then wanting, not wanting green infrastructure to complete with the, the, you know, the maintenance of existing wastewater treatment plants. Um, so things like that have come up as, you know, as, as sort of technical issues, but, um, but no, no real opposition that we're aware of. Probably the biggest quote, opposition, unquote, is just the complexity of it and, and the newness of it. And speaking of that, are there other states that have this approach or is this kind of the first of its kind? Yeah, Maryland would be the first, first state in the country to do this, first state to have a, a green infrastructure definition as comprehensive as this one, first state or federal, you know, no federal laws in the space either to define blue infrastructure, like ocean-based uh, infrastructure. So the bill is full of a number of firsts that um, I, I'm, I'm happy to be in Montana right now and somebody from Wyoming is sitting next to me and he said, could you come in and brief us on, on the bill? Because I work with the legislature a lot and we'd love to figure out how to make some of this work. Yeah, that'd be great. Be a nice, a nice uh, feather in Maryland's cap to be the leader in this. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you, Tim. Um, let me turn to Jeff. And Jeff, I uh, uh, am particularly interested in your perspective on this as a private investor. Um, you're, you're in the business um, to make environmental improvements, but you're also in the business of making money. And so it, I'm interested to hear what, what you think about this. Um, and I also want to make the point here that um, there's a nonprofit in DC that tracks sustainable investing. It's called US SIP, Sustainable Investment Forum. And every two years, they look at the assets that are being managed and how those assets are being managed, what drives those um, decision makings on those assets. And they found between 2018 and 2020 that there was a 42% increase 
in the amount of investments that were occurring with what they what's referred to as an ESG, an environment, social, and governance lens. So more and more private dollars are being invested by people that uh, care about environment and social issues. With that backdrop, let me ask you, Jeff, tell me a little bit more about Hannon Armstrong, what you do, how you do it, and also I'd be interested in your personal motivation to do this kind of work. Uh, thank you, Kim, uh, and thank you to Marilyn LCV for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, Hannah Armstrong is a 40-year-old firm. We invest approximately $2 billion a year, and we are the only public company to uh, have the vision that we will only make climate-positive investments. Uh, all the big banks continue to fund fossil fuels, and we're running out of time. We've, we've created what we think is not a very um, radical idea. Uh, given the reality of climate change, but apparently it is in, in terms of Wall Street firms. Um, so we're, we're making um, climate positive investments all over the country. Uh, in the intro, you mentioned renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, but also sustainable infrastructure, of which these projects enabled by this legislation uh, would become a much bigger piece of this. And uh, the... Uh, the value in this piece of legislation is not that the private sector does everything really, really well and the public sector doesn't. There are many, many brilliant engineers in the public sector. What they're constrained by is like a homeowner who only pays cash for a home. Uh, that's hard if uh, you, 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 you can't leverage it. The, the problem is the, the procurement systems in most state governments and in federal governments don't allow for multi-year contracting. Uh, you have to have annual appropriations. That leads to very small suboptimal projects or projects that are optimized for the annual appropriation, not for the environmental problem you're trying to solve. We've seen this work extremely well with the, the US government, starting with a law in 1992 and the Energy Policy Act to create energy savings performance contracts. It's now been uh, $10 billion of private capital, um, fantastic outcomes for, uh, for the US government in terms of save the US treasury money. Um, it created jobs in all 50 states, proved conditions for federal workers, uh, including servicemen and women. And uh, one of the intents was to vastly reduce the carbon footprint of the world's largest real estate owner, the US government. It has been check, 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 check a complete bipartisan success. Um, I think this bill borrows all the great elements of the ESPC legislation and, and can be very successful. What it allows the private sector to do is scale projects much faster than under current appropriations policy. Mm -hmm. um, and when you have bigger projects, you have economies of scale, saves the taxpayers money, um, and you can also go a heck of a lot faster, which Anybody who's paying attention to the uh, health of the Bay knows we're frankly going backwards um, uh, on Bay health. And uh, so we've got to go much, much faster and much, much bigger. And this bill allows that to happen. Right, uh, and thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> the sense of urgency when it comes to this work is I just, it cannot be overstated from my mind. Um, one of the things that, in my reading of the bill is that it, it also provides um, quite a message and uh, signals and structure and policies that I would think would be reassuring to a private investor, but I don't wanna speak for you. Do you read the bill and would that make you and your investors feel more comfortable investing in Maryland? Oh, um, we have Treasurer Kopp on um, who has done a fabulous job of maintaining uh, Maryland's credit rating. Uh, there's zero concern about uh, the state credit. The challenge is always the contract. And this has the elements that a good um, multi-year contract should have. Um, and what it does importantly is leaves the uh, Maryland state government in charge. The state government gets to define the outcomes they're looking for um, the, uh, you know, the labor standards, that all rests with um, the state of Maryland. And once those rules are written, 
Um, we have zero concern about the state of Maryland following the rules. That just opens the door for uh, private investors like ourselves to, to come in. And we've done, uh, I would say, 45 million of these projects, maybe 15 of these projects around the state. Um, you know, and the great projects, they work. Um, but 45 million is a drop in a bucket of what needs to be mobilized to, to uh, uh, start to fix the, uh, uh, the problems we, we see that uh, this bill addresses. And just to clarify, when you say 45 million, you're, you're talking about dollars, not number of uh, projects. I tend, I tend to talk a lot about dollars. <laughs> yeah. I just want to be here. So, but that, it's enormous, $45 million investment um, from the private sector. But uh, and they're $1 million, $2 million projects. Um, and that's where the, the scale economies come in. Everyone has to be have lawyers, engineers, permits. Um, that's just not enough work getting done for the overhead cost of administering and, and developing these projects. If they were 10 million and we did a, a $30 million project or $20 million project at Tinker's Creek, uh, Creek in, in PG County, you know, that starts to be a, a more economical kind of project. Right. Yeah. And actually, Jeff, maybe um, could you just give us an example of how some, a, a project like that works from sort of soup to nuts? Um, quickly. <laughs> so um, yes, there are great companies, uh, two here in Maryland, EIP and Greenvest, who will identify the, um, uh, the environment that needs some kind of restoration. And um, they will develop along with the state. Uh, in this case, uh, I think it was uh, Department of Transportation had an obligation to generate offsets. And Tim, jump in here, because you know this uh, better than anybody on this call. Um, and uh, Greenvest worked with the uh, Department of Transportation to define a project that would produce enough environmental offsets to satisfy the, the state's need. And, and then permits were applied for, and, and then the work started. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of civil engineering. It's not um, uh, a lot of complexity in technology. Uh, but, you know, you know, fairly interesting uh, uh, civil engineering project. And um, in five years or each year, um, uh, Greenvest gets paid by the state. Uh, that's how we get repaid um, when Greenvest produces the, uh, the environmental outcomes that the state bargained for. Mm -hmm. Tim, what would you add to that? I, I don't know, Jeff. You said it pretty perfectly. I, uh, I, I think um, you usually, I just add a couple of details. You often or usually have land protection as part of it. So if it's not right. already public land, which it often isn't, there's a requirement to put a conservation easement on the property. So you get um, not just the annual benefits from the restoration activity, but you get um, you know long-term conservation. Uh, and then there's a mix of different models, but quite often there's a um, a company like EIP that's that's leading the project, but they're working with you know local subcontractors, small local businesses, right. minority-owned businesses, and there's a big initiative like this and. Prince George's County, where the, the intermediary has done something like 200 contracts with small local businesses, 80% minority workforce, you know, 80, more than 80% local jobs. Um, and that kind of like doing 200 subcontracts is just not something a local agency is going to be able to do efficiently, but, um, but the, the, their partner can. Um, so I, if it isn't evident, I'm a big fan of this approach and I, and I love having more people, more entities at the table addressing this. Um, before I open it up, and just to uh, those of you that are phoning in, feel free to type questions in the chat, or uh, you know, if you wanna raise your hand, we can call on you, but i um, happy to facilitate those questions. So just go ahead and type them in. Um, prior to that though, we have a number of folks on the call here that are conservationists. They care deeply about improving the environment, improving our climate, believing the political system has a role in that. So from your perspective, what advice do you have to them on what they can do? How can they be part of the solution in this arena of conservation financing? Uh, Tim, well, let me start with you. Yeah, sure. I mean, the first simple one, just to, just to be um, really explicit about this is, I'm thrilled that my Senator Will Smith is a co-sponsor of the Senate bill, but it would be great to have more people reach out to more uh, delegates and, and Senate members. So Kim, thank you for sharing the bill numbers and uh, those legislators always appreciate either a thanks for co-sponsoring or, 
hey, this is a good bill. Uh, maybe it'd be great to have you get on it. So that's a that's one simple step. Um, the other is just that you know there's there's a lot of opportunities for uh, for ecological restoration and, and protection of natural resources in your communities. So that the, the more we can lift up those kinds of projects, find them, uh, help support the work that goes on in them, you know, the, the more we can do uh, in our own, you know, backyards and neighborhoods and, and, and local areas where we, you know, walk dogs and, and uh, enjoy the, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Thank you. And Jeff, um, also, I, I do see a question. Um, if you can provide information on contacting your company about investments, so, or for investment. So, Advice for the HASI. Okay. Yeah, your water bottle has the acronym. Oh yeah, yeah, I've got my my uh, my brand there. Yeah. Um, but what what advice would you have for our members um, and folks that want to engage in this issue? Uh, yeah, write letters. Uh, uh, they have an impact. We we've all learned the hard way that elections have consequences and and um, democracy matters. So. Uh, engage um, much more aggressively. I, I've been, was really impressed with the, the quality of questions from the House uh, delegates. Uh, it, very substantive, very um, sophisticated questions about, you know, how do you get, how does the government get screwed in this? Um, and having done this a long time, um, it, it, it truly is a, a, a good deal for both sides. Uh, but it's not a, a simple deal. I did see you had one question in the chat room of why does it have to be the government? Um, and I would just like to maybe address that. In, in this case, the state of Maryland has the liability. They have the need under EPA um, uh, uh, requirements to reduce um, nitrogen and phosphorus runoff, for instance. The same model works um, for the private sector. We do energy efficiency projects with, uh, oh, we just did one with McCormick Spice. Um, and uh, they're paying out of savings once those savings are, are approved. So um, it, the model is not a government subsidy kind of a model. It's just a way to get outcomes much faster and cheaper. Can I, I just add to that, um, and that's, a, that's, that's one great example, but you know, there's sort of increasing opportunity for uh, the private sector to pay for things like um, sequestering uh, so, sequestering carbon in healthy soils. Um, there's already a lot of projects going on around the country where that's happening on a voluntary basis, increasing in, uh, interest in, in biodiversity and, and how uh, businesses can make sure they're not doing a, you know, uh, creating a, a net harm to biodiversity. And so the legislation is, is facilitating the opportunity to make those kinds of transactions happen uh, in Maryland. and. Um, you know, every state sort of has to think about this on their own a little bit in the absence of any national policy. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to do so. I think in 2021, the, the sort of global market for those voluntary, and just in the carbon space, those voluntary carbon credits doubled. It's, you know, it's 100, Jeff would know the numbers better, but it's, you know, you're talking about $100 billion plus being invested now. So there's a lot of private uh, buyers. And then even in the water quality space, so one, there's Maryland um, doing this kind of work, but also when there's um, development, a new Walmart parking lot or something, there's, there's requirements to make sure that the damage from that is either avoided completely, or if it's not avoided completely, that the remaining damage gets offset. And that's also, you know, private money that would pay for that, uh, both in the short and the long term. Yeah, those, those are great examples. And <clears throat> um, looking here at these questions, um, Stuart Clark, good friend of ours, uh, asked, per, um, can someone talk a little bit more uh, perhaps offer additional examples of how the legislation removes existing obstacles to deploying these kinds of conservation finance strategies. Um, Tim? Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. And, and I'll just I'll use an out-of-state example. Um, in Louisiana, the, the example is that there was a, a big giant uh, natural gas facility. That it took less time to permit the natural gas facility than to permit the wetland restoration to offset the damage. So it can be really difficult to get a permit to do something that's really, really good for the environment, whether it's activities in the Bay, like oyster reef restoration or, or on land. Um, and so one of the things the bill does is it creates a commission with a diversity of representation, restoration businesses, nonprofit, uh, environmental groups, individual citizens, et cetera, to try to look for the obstacles that get in the way of, of doing you know, everything from tree planting to, to, to really the large scale kinds of projects that Jeff was describing before. 
So that's one of the one of the best examples of getting rid of barriers. So it's basically like we need a we need a holding space and a, and a brainstorming space to help figure out what some of those obstacles are because it's comp it's complicated, right? There's a lot of permits and things required often. Yeah, that's great. Um, and Jeff Corbin, another good friend who's uh, working in the restoration uh, community now, uh, has many projects going on. He's he's asking, I think, a really important question: is that does the environmental community are we concerned that this setup might siphon money away from typically grant funded programs? Um, and um, I, not that I'm the spokesperson for the environmental community, but I am not because the legislation is drafted to drive outcomes. So it, you know, as long as those dollars are going for outcomes and in this particular case, achieving those outcomes faster and more, I don't have that concern. But Tim, have you ever talked to anybody that's worried about that? I don't think it's come up in quite that way. And I, I note that the bill has the support of, of you know, whole diversity of, of uh, nonprofits that typically get grants, groups like the Nature Conservancy and the Land Trust uh, Alliance. Um, lots of other, you know, support from those kinds of groups. And, and I think, Kim, the answer you gave about, you know, as long as it's producing results, um, that's what matters. The, the one other comment I'd, I'd make is that um, sometimes things get presented as an either or, of, you know, binary. And what I think is really going to happen is it's just one more approach, right? So you'll see grant funded projects happening side by side with outcome focused projects. Um, big, complicated, very, very large, you know, sort of partnership structured projects. And then, you know, continued sort of smaller projects that are, you know, um, paid for or designed in, in increments. And so it's really just adding, you know, one more tool to that uh, toolbox. There are some cases where this kind of work makes sense. You know, for example, when we know that projects are, you know, there's a sort of a repeatable way to do them. Uh, when you have really innovative work where nobody's really certain it's going to work out, it's a better use of a grant. Very well done. Um, Jeff, there's some questions around, um, I think Hannah and Armstrong and how you work, um, and I'm going to combine these, but um, do you have examples of where you've done projects that have reduced overall emissions, distinctly, clearly documented emission reductions? And for example, anything related to leaking fossil fuels from wells? Um, would love to uh, get into the methane uh capping business, um, but we need a price on carbon in order for that to pay. So uh, we've not done, done that, but every project that we do, we only have one investment criteria, and that is the investment has to reduce carbon or have some other positive environmental attribute. And we're the most rigorous counter of carbon. We use our carbon count metric to measure the amount of carbon reduced in every project and the efficiency with which we're using capital uh, to reduce that, uh, uh, that, that carbon. Um, given the trillions of dollars that's needed for uh, global decarbonization, we better be very efficient with it. So um, all that data is on our website. It's in all our SEC filings. Again, we're the only public company with that level of disclosure about carbon um, in uh, SEC filings. Um, so yeah, if I'm not talking about dollars, I'm talking about uh, uh, tons of carbon. Great, good. Um, we're coming up on, on the half hour, although there's a lot of questions coming in still. Um, uh, yeah, and Tim, maybe j real quickly, how, how will this bill um, ensure that there are emission reductions? Um, you know, Maryland last year, there was a big effort at comprehensive climate legislation. And so those are, you know, the solutions go way beyond the sort of small scale changes we're, we're able to make in this bill. Um, but what you're really trying to do is create, you know, the alternative, right, to say there are ways to offset emissions. There's a way for state agencies to pay to, you know, to offset the remaining part of their fleet that isn't electrified in five and 10 years. Um, you're creating the option to, to make that part of the solution work, work faster. Um, and so I think of it as a sort of tool in that process of overall, you know, emissions reduction and, and a lot of sequestration of, of, of carbon and then also avoided, you know, pollution of nitrogen and phosphorus and sediment. Um, Kim, just quickly on the last question that I think it's an important one about um, how could you do contracts like this in Maryland before without this legislation? 
Um, I am so proud of my state because I've seen so many examples of local government and the state department of transportation that have basically shoehorned existing authorities to make something like this work. And, you know, it's a great example of leadership and local government that they find ways to like, to like deliver. Um, but those are brave people, right. Who really like go beyond uh, the scope of their normal job to try something a bit different. And what this legislation is doing is building on their innovation to say, let's make it easier for everybody including those folks who don't necessarily want to step out ahead to do this kind of work. That's, that's really what it's doing. It's sort of building on their, their good, good, uh, good pilot projects. And uh, since the question is about Tinker's Creek, we haven't actually gotten paid all the way back yet. There still have to be outcomes delivered to the state of Maryland before we get our return. So, uh, but I agree with Tim that if you can standardize contracts, standardize the process, it all goes so much faster and more effectively. Well, Tim and Jeff, thank you. Um, obviously, this is a both complicated um, but hugely exciting opportunity for the state. And I, I hope that you know in years to come we can have you back and talk about the successes of this program and the and the bill. And also, I want to thank you for your leadership in working on it and supporting it. Um, it's great to have the um, folks beyond advocates at the table. So thank you for that. And for the rest of you, thank you for joining us today. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about electric school buses. And you know lots about electric cars. You've heard about them. Many of you might own them or are interested in owning them. This is school buses. And this has a lot to do with justice and public health and school children. Um, so it'll be a good and there's legislation around it. Uh, all of these are feeding into Maryland LCV's sincere work around improving the climate and uh, being uh, in, including climate justice, addressing climate justice. So uh, all of these topics are focusing in on that work and next week will be a real interesting one. We'll also be digging deep uh, in the weeks ahead on the comprehensive climate bills that are being introduced and discussed. Um, four hour and 45 minute hearing on Tuesday in the Senate on one. So lots to discuss there. But thank you again for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And Jeff and Tim, again, thank you. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, Kim. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Bye.